ago, something very weird happened with my best friend and I. I was 15 years old. One night I decided to sleep over at my friend's house. After a night of scary movies, we were in the mood to do something exciting. Not far from my friend's house was a demolishing site. A block of houses in a very terrible state that would be demolished the day after tomorrow. The local government would demolish them to make room for new houses. The whole site was fenced in and warning signs saying do not enter hung everywhere. The houses were boarded up by planks. Doors and windows were sealed shut. No one could get in. We decided to go for a walk on the old block and take some random photographs. My friend knew a spot where we could enter the old block. When we walked there, we noticed that every house was boarded up tight so we couldn't get in. We noticed a house with a window on the top floor that wasn't very well boarded up. We could see into the room. We took a photo with a digital camera. Later we went home and took a look at the pictures we made. Suddenly we came across the photo of the window. We saw a woman dressed in a brown raincoat with white skin and black hair as long as we could visibly see. The woman looked very sad. We hadn't seen any woman up there when we took the picture. Moreover, the windows and doors were boarded. We went back to the house to see if that was correct. After investigation, it really was. Everything was tied shut, and there was no woman. This story isn't mine, but rather of my friend from Japan. I'll call him Rita. It happened back when Rita was only about 11 or 12 years old. Rita was a rather attractive kid and had his fair share of admirers. One girl was extreme with her crush though. I'll call her Ayano. Ayano was a lot older than Rita. She was 17. She was an acquaintance of Rita and lived down the road from him. Rita hadn't thought much of her until she started stalking him. Every day and every night, she would be following him one way or another, whether it be in person or online. Rita first started getting the creeps when she would start messaging him over 20 times a day. Stuff like, be safe, are you alright, sleep well, etc. This was a little weird but he overlooked it. Then the messages started getting creepier. Instead of the usual checkup emails, they got more personal. Things like, you should eat your lunch, if he skipped lunch, or I think your sister is hungry when his little sister was crying. Rita stopped using both his phone and social media at this point, but it doesn't end there. Rita's mother was almost never home, so he was frequently looked after by babysitters. One day he had a new babysitter. It was Ayano. Nothing was particularly strange as she looked after him and his siblings, but she did get a lot closer to his mother than he would like. One day at school, Ayano approached Rita and told him that his mother would be out of the country for a week and that she told her to let Rita stay at her house. Rita was hesitant at first, but hey, it was his mother's wish. He couldn't go against that. Ayano told him that his mother had already left, so he could go home with her after school that day. Rita reluctantly agreed and went home with her. When he got there, her parents weren't home. Things get a little blurry here as my friend choked up telling the story as it still scares him today. He said Ayano would play weird games with him, stuff like family, where she insisted she was the wife and he was the husband, as well as things like cops and robbers and games to see who would get scared first, where she would blindfold him and leave him in a silent room for hours on end. It was five days into staying at her house, and Ayano had gone to her part-time job. She had left the doors locked and the windows were too high to jump from, so he just stayed in front of the TV where he saw a chilling news report. It was a missing child report, the missing child being him. Before he had the time to catch the number to call, the TV switched off, and Ayano was standing behind him with the remote in her hand. Rita had freaked out, crying and screaming. Ayano held him, but he managed to wiggle from her grasp just in time to open a window and cry for help. Luckily for him, a couple were walking past, heard his cries and called the police. Within an hour, 
police arrived and found him locked in her bedroom with a blindfold and his hands tied. Due to Ayano still being a minor, Rita is unsure of what happened to her. He says he only remembers the police taking her away while his mother was hugging him. He moved to Australia after this and hasn't seen his kidnapper since, but he still cowers at the sound of her name. About five years ago, I lived downtown in a major city in the US. I've always been a night person, so I would often find myself bored after my roommate, who was decidedly not a night person, went to sleep. To pass the time, I used to go for long walks and spend the time thinking. I spent four years like that, walking alone at night, and never once had a reason to feel afraid. I always used to joke with my roommates that even the drug dealers in the city were polite but all that changed in just a few minutes of one evening. It was a Wednesday, somewhere between 1 and 2 in the morning, and I was walking near a police patrolled park quite a ways from my apartment. It was a quiet night, even for a weeknight, with very little traffic and almost no one on foot. The park, as it was most nights, was completely empty. I went down a short side street in order to loop back down my apartment when I first noticed him. At the far end of the street, on my side, was the silhouette of a man dancing. It was a strange dance, similar to a waltz, but he finished each box with an odd forward stride. I guess you could say he was dance walking, headed straight for me. Deciding he was probably drunk, I stepped as close as I could to the road to give him the majority of the sidewalk to pass me. The closer he got, the more I realized how gracefully he was moving. He was very tall and lanky and wearing an old suit. He danced closer still until I could make out his face. His eyes were open wide and wild, head tilted back slightly looking off at the sky. His mouth was formed in a painfully wide cartoon of a smile. Between the eyes and the smile, I decided to cross the street before he danced any closer. I took my eyes off of him to cross the empty street. As I reached the other side, I glanced back, and then stopped dead in my tracks. He had stopped dancing and was standing with one foot in the street, perfectly parallel to me. He was facing me but still looking skyward, smile still wide on his lips. I was completely and utterly unnerved by this. I started walking again but kept my eyes on the man. He didn't move. Once I had put about half a block between us, I turned away from him for a moment to watch the sidewalk in front of me. The street and sidewalk ahead of me were completely empty. Still unnerved, I looked back to where he had been standing to find him gone. For the briefest of moments I felt relieved, until I noticed him. He had crossed the street and was now slightly crouched down. I couldn't tell for sure due to the distance and the shadows, but I was certain he was facing me. I had looked away from him for no more than 10 seconds, so it was clear that he had moved fast. I was so shocked and I stood there for some time, staring at him, and then he started moving toward me again. He took giant, exaggerated, tiptoed steps, as if he were a cartoon character sneaking up on someone, except he was moving very, very quickly. I'd like to say at this point that I ran away or pulled out my pepper spray or cell phone or anything at all, but I didn't. I just stood there, completely frozen, as the smiling man crept toward me. And then he stopped again, about a car length away from me, still smiling his smile, still looking to the sky. When I finally found my voice, I blurted out the first thing that came to mind. What I meant to ask was, what the fuck do you want? In an angry, commanding tone, what came out was a whimper. W what the fuck? Regardless of whether or not humans can smell fear, they can certainly hear it. I heard it in my own voice. That only made me more afraid. But he didn't react to it at all. He just stood there, smiling. And then, after what felt like forever, he turned around, very slowly, and started dance walking away. Just like that. Not wanting to turn my back to him again, I just watched him go, until he was far enough away to almost be out of sight. 
and then I realized something. He wasn't moving away anymore, nor was he dancing. I watched in horror as the distant shape of him got bigger and bigger. He was coming back my way. He was coming back my way, and this time he was running. I ran too. I ran until I was off the side road and back onto a better lit road with sparse traffic. Looking behind me then, he was nowhere to be found. The rest of my way home, I kept glancing over my shoulder, always expecting to see his stupid smile, but he was never there. I lived in that city for six months after that, and I never went out for another walk. There was something about his face that always haunted me. He didn't look drunk. He didn't look high. He looked completely and utterly insane. And that's a very, very scary thing to see. In the mid-80s, my mom was a cleaner in Australia. She would clean houses in suburban areas and would sometimes do houses in rural or wine regions. She would leave business cards at the local shops and got most of her business this way, and some through referrals and word of mouth. One day she got a call from a lady who sounded like she was around 60, asking mom to clean her old farmhouse. She made a lot of odd demands, and mom would usually meet clients before taking on new business. In this case, the lady did not want to meet my mom, and said she would leave the keys under the front doormat. Mom agreed mainly because the lady was quite obviously wealthy and was offering to pay mom substantially more than she would reasonably expect. Mom went to the house on a Monday morning and said she already felt unnerved by the long driveway. The house was essentially in the middle of a very large and very empty property. She found the keys and started cleaning. About an hour into the clean, she hears the back door shut. Mom was told no one would be at the house so she immediately felt unsafe. She stood frozen in the kitchen for what she said felt like three or four minutes, although she said it could have been much longer. There was no other car on the property. She wanted to leave immediately, but had two rooms left to do. Both were bedrooms. She said as time passed and she heard nothing else, she decided that perhaps it was nothing, or perhaps something had fallen and it wasn't the door after all. She walked up the hallway and stepped into the bedroom, all over the bed were black and white photos. As mom got closer, she realized that the photos were all of her. Some were taken at our family home, and others were taken at other houses mom would clean. Some through windows or over fences. She used the house phone to call the police and immediately drove to the end of the driveway. The lady ended up being investigated, but continued to claim that it was a break-in. After some time, the police stopped with their searching and we ended up moving to a new town four months later. I'm 22, and this incident happened a year and a half ago. I had just moved into my first apartment and was in the process of moving in. The door that led to my apartment locks itself automatically when closed. So. I was going to the entrance of the apartment complex to get my mail while talking on the phone with my friend. I returned to the apartment and sat on the bed while opening the mail while using the phone. I dropped the phone on the floor and it landed under the bed, so I had to lie on the floor and stretch for it. I saw something that caught my eye. There was someone under my bed. My eyes widened and I choked the urge to scream. The person under my bed was lying still with his back towards me and his head to his chest, so I couldn't see his face, and he didn't see me. Trying to be rational while so many thoughts rushed through my head, I picked up the phone, said, Sorry, I, I dropped my phone. I'm just going to take a shower and call you back. The bathroom is right by my bed, so I hastily walked in, quietly locked the door, turned the shower on, jumped out my window, and called the police. They told me to wait nearby, but to go across the street and see if anybody comes out the door of the apartment complex. This was during the summer and it was still light out. I placed myself across the street, hiding behind a car while watching my open bathroom window and the entry door. I called my friend and he came over just before the police. I gave them my keys and they went inside. Only moments later, two cops came out holding a thin and tired looking man. 
His eyes looked crazy, but he didn't try to get away. The policeman that stood beside me and comforted me while the police searched through my house told me that the man stood outside my bathroom door with one of my kitchen knives waiting for me to come out. This man had somehow crept in my entry door while I was getting my mail and hid under the bed. The man that was trying to hurt me turned out to be a homeless person and was placed in a mental hospital 